I want to first get to Goldman Sachs because we're seeing uh, the, the stock under pressure pre-market. What did you make of that quarter? Why is the stock down? I, mean, I think the quarter was was okay. I mean, revenues were a little bit light, but I don't think that's really the big deal. The 571 is a big headline beat, but they had a, a, the, a, at this point unquantified tax benefit, which probably brings the number down closer to 514. And then the comp ratio came in at 37 percent. We were looking for kind of 40 percent. It was almost 41 percent last year. That's really kind of what drove the beat. If you if you normalize those two things back out. I think you wind up getting pretty close to the, the, the 489 kind of consensus number, which is still not a miss. I mean, you're still good results, but in the wake of what we saw from J.P. Morgan last Friday and we're seeing from Citigroup today, mm -hmm. you know, it probably looks a little softer than people were hoping versus, versus peers. What, what needs to happen in order for this group to trade higher, Jeff? Well, we, I think we need kind of three things to happen, right? One is capital markets. I mean, this was the first quarter. It's always the best quarter of the year for trading, certainly. That's got to get better as we go forward. There's still kind of, I think, some hangover from that being soft. Secondly, global GDP, right? We need some resolution on the trade growth, on the trade conflict side and kind of get a little, a little more stable on global GDP growth. And then a third would be kind of U.S. GDP growth. But we need to, I think people need to get more confident in, GD, in, in economic growth and more confident the capital markets can actually still have some strength ahead of them. Right. I mean, it's funny that you say more, more confidence in, in growth around the world in general. I mean, we're seeing markets that have been on a tear uh, so far this year. I mean, whether you look at the U.S. or China, et cetera, I mean, I, I don't know what's not convincing investors and banks in particular that there is no growth. Or the growth is not to be counted on if the rest of the world is being bid higher, Jeff. Well, I mean, it's been a strong year to date for the equity market, certainly. But if you back that back to last summer before the fourth quarter sell-off, we're kind of treading water, right? Mm. So it's, it's kind of a recovery built in here. But I think people are skeptical, right? I mean, recency sits in people's minds. And the last recession they remember was the financial crisis. Right. So I think the fears that we're coming into a recession, I don't think we are. But to the extent we are, it's probably something really slow and shallow. But the fear out there is it's going to be really deep and really problematic again. And to some extent, we might just have to kind of keep going forward and prove that wrong to get to get things to go up, which turns into a little bit more of an upward grind for the stocks and, you know, the next catalyst driven leap. I uh, want to bring in Wilfred Frost. He's been uh, working the phone. So, uh, Wilf, what have you been hearing? Yeah, Vanessa, just been uh, speaking to uh, some people at uh, Goldman Sachs familiar with the earnings and uh, pretty uh, optimistic about the outlook, saying that the IPO outlook in Q1 was very much affected uh, by the government shutdown. That, of course, is all coming into play Q2, that they're going to be lead underwriter on two or three of the big ones. Of course, we already know about that on Uber, but very optimistic about how the IPO pipeline will play out for them in the second quarter. Also an investor in Uber, so they'll make a lot of money on that one. Also very optimistic that this very strong first quarter in M&A can continue, said absent of a big slowdown in the U.S. economy, which they don't expect. They think that that will continue as well. No further provisions they confirmed on 1MDB. All of that, they say, has been provided for in prior quarters. Uh, and then very optimistic about some of these new areas, the partnership with Apple and the credit card. Uh, and opening up their trading software marquee to clients, uh, which we know is happening on the Apple card, said it's fully tested on employees. They'll be ready uh, to launch that with Apple mid to late summer uh, and expecting a very strong takeoff, uh, take up of that, very optimistic on it and the way that in due course it can really boost their other consumer business, Marcus. Uh, so upbeat comments and their cool starts in, in about half an hour's time. All right. Thanks for that, Will. Wilfred Frost joining us from headquarters. Jeff, I want to get back to you. Um, you sound pretty lukewarm on banks overall, but I would imagine that there's at least a few buy ratings in there. So, uh, you know, what is what is the case for investors? If three things have to happen on your list in order for this group to trade higher, why should you buy them right now? Well, I think specifically in my list, we're talking kind of large cap banks at GSIPs. Mm -hmm. They've got a very big advantage, and that's scale. Scale matters more now than ever before in banking. We're just starting to see it come through. So if we can have any kind of revenue tailwinds, a lot of that's going to fall through to the bottom line. And I do think the ability to invest in, in technology and things like that should drive some, some top-line growth there, too. So for those looking at bank stocks or financials in general, I'd be looking at the, the large-cap big ones. I mean, Citi's one I like a lot, and they reported this morning, too. And actually, the numbers look really good. I mean, the big thing we needed to see was consumer growth, and we saw it. They kind of delivered, again, on, on the kind of the big market skepticism there. So that's one I think people should be looking at.